Take your seats. We appreciate it. And uh, if anybody feels like the need to get up or get water or anything during this uh, panel, feel free to do that. Um, so welcome back. Um, and let me say thank you to UMass and the people who put the lunch on. It was a, a, I know I had a nice sandwich and enjoyed it. Um, so this is, a, 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 well, let me introduce myself. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a, an associate professor with the Department of Environmental Conservation and also with the Center for Public Policy and Administration here at UMass. And I'll be the moderator um, for this panel, and the panel session is Environmental Conservation and Sustainability. Um, when I was thinking about how to, how to start this, I thought, well, let me try to set the stage. And so what I'm about to show you, just a couple slides and, and, and walk through it, are things that I found on the congressman's uh, website, so uh, kind of linking to this panel. Okay, so this, this side under his, he, on, the, on the website there's several issue areas, and one of the issue areas is environment and land conservation. And I thought this particular quote was, was helpful at the start of this. Uh, throughout my tenure in Congress, I have fought hard for legislation to protect endangered wildlife and critical wildlife habitat, to preserve our public lands, and to promote sustainable science-based management of America's natural resources. And then if you dig down a little bit further on these pages, he had several um, topics that are particularly of interest to him around this. And so the first one was tackling global climate change. And I, I was trying to do some data mining in terms of Thomas. He's got a link to the Thomas system. And I, it's a good read. If you haven't been to the website, it's a good read. Um, and I was looking some, to some of the uh, legislative record that he's done. And so I'm sure this is just what I pulled out. I'm sure there's a, many, many, many other things. Uh, but one of the things was uh, he introduced the Nat National Greenhouse Gas, Emission, Gas Emissions Inventory Act of 2005. He introduced the Climate Stewardship Act of 2007. And uh, most recently, and that's again just a couple things that I saw in that list, but then uh, in September there was an article in uh, the newspaper that he wrote that had a, a newspaper story, uh, the, the title of it was Climate Change Alarm Ringing. Um, noting the lack of, and that article was noting the lack of federal action and emphasizing many of the achievements that uh, our, our Commonwealth has, has had. Um, to me, um, having this issue listed so prominently, I believe, makes a really strong statement in his support in that earlier point in that quote about the importance of science-based management of America's natural resources. And as somebody who crosses uh, the environmental conservation field as a scientist, and also somebody who deals in public policy, I, I personally am appreciative of having somebody taking that kind of leadership, um, linking science to policy. Um, the second area uh, he lists in there is keeping America's air and water clean. And there he's noting um, his support for vigorous enforcement of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, along with uh, um, encouraging the efforts of the Environmental Protection Agency to work on those issues. He then had another point that uh, links to um, the next panel, um, um, offshore drilling and his opposition to offshore drilling. And in that section, one of the things that uh, I found interesting was his, his point about polluters should pay for their own messes, taxpayers should never be left on the hook for a private company's failure. Um, and again, the, the third panel will be talking more about, I think, this issue. The fourth point, I've, hit two of them, but the fourth point is responsible management of public landscapes. And there he's mentioning his support for preservation of spectacular and environmentally vi vital areas, and specifically talks about his opposition to the oil drilling in the Arctic National Refuge System. Um, he also notes that in 2009 and 2010, he, he pushed for budget increases in the National Park System and the National Wildlife Refuges. It brings me to the, the last bullet, land conservation in Massachusetts, 
Um, he talks about the ongoing support, and this more locally, the ongoing support for the Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge, um, which many of you know is, is a, an area that's working to conserve the uh, biodiversity and the animal habitat for the Connecticut River uh, watershed. And I should note, uh, personally, as somebody who's been here for about 12 years, that I've seen uh, just terrific collaboration in my Department of Environmental Conservation between Conti um, researchers and scientists in our department, um, both in terms of some of those people being adjunct faculty here, and, and also we have, we've had graduate students who have worked on projects in collaboration. So I, I've seen that firsthand, the importance um, here for New UMass of that, that connection. Um, finally, under this area, and this links to the earlier discussion at least a little bit, I think, is he introduced and secured passage of two land conservation bills, specifically protecting land in Massachusetts. One was the Freedom Ways Heritage Area Act, which uh, assists in the preservation of uh, 45 historically rich communities, both in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And then also he uh, uh, worked on and got past the New England Scenic Trail Act, which designates the MMM trail system as a New England National Scenic Trail. And for that, I'm sure everyone understands that that means it qualifies for uh, funding for preservation and for uh, continued uh, upkeep. And it also extended the uh, trail roughly 30 miles. And based on the earlier uh, panel, I expect much of that is probably bikeable. Um, Okay, with that context, I just hope that I was trying to set the stage for what this panel was about, and now we've got a ter terrific uh, panel lined up. Um, and, and like the earlier panel, we, we were asking them to provide their own perspectives, so maybe a finer scale perspective of uh, Congressman Olver's accomplishments and contributions to environmental conservation and sustainability. And then we also asked them possibly to reflect a little on moving forward, what are, we, what are, what are the pressing things we should be on the agenda. Um, our panelists include uh, Dean Steve Go Stephen Goodwin, who is the Dean of the UMass College of Natural Sciences. Um, and this is slightly different order than, than in the program. And then we'll have uh, Kristen DeBoer, who is the Executive Director of Kestrel Land Trust. And then lastly, we have Ira Leighton, who is the Deputy Regional Administrator of US uh, EPA Region 1, that's the, US, the New England states. So we'll, we'll try to go anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes for each one of them. I'll introduce, I'll give a little introduction before each one of them speaks. So, uh, and then we'll, after that, we'll have time like the first panel to have question and answers. And uh, if the congressman likes at the end of it, we welcome his comments like he did this morning. So with that, let me introduce our first uh, speaker. So Dean Stephen Goodwin um, is the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences here at UMass. He joined in 1986 as a faculty member in the Department of Microbiology, focusing his re research on environmental microbiology. Uh, he's, he's a huge advocate, linking back to the panel earlier and the discussion earlier, uh, working to improve, incorporate issues of sustainability into the, into the university, the UMass, academic mission, which he believes is a key to achieving a more diverse student body and a sustainable campus. And for example, I've witnessed in my own department his leadership in establishing a master's degree in sustainability at UMass. At UMass. Um, Dean Goodwin, prior to coming here, was an environmental activist when he was a student at the University of Virginia working to promote solar and renewable energy. He serves on board, the board of communities involved in supporting agriculture as a member of the Environmental Performance Advisory Committee at UMass. Um, he and the congressman both have supported the construction of the new integrated science building at UMass. He may talk about that more. And then uh, just to finalize, he, he's got a BS in uh, zoology from the University of Maine, a master's in environmental science from the Virgi University of Virginia and a PhD in bacteriology from the University of Wisconsin. So with that, I'll turn, that o turn it over to Dean Goodwin. Well, it's amazing what you can learn from the internet, huh? <laughs> so if we're gonna understand the impact that Congress, uh, Congressman Oliver has had on the UMass campus and our thinking around sustainability and the environment, 
and I hope at the same time understand a little bit about the impact that the campus has had on the congressman and his thinking about sustainability and the environment. We have to keep in mind that he was a chemistry professor here at UMass, which means that he understands the campus, he understands UMass, he understands higher education, and he brings a scientist's perspective to sustainability and the environment. So it wasn't just the congressman's funding priorities that influenced sustainability here on the campus. It was his active participation. He participated in symposia. He was here as part of the public debate about what the campus should be doing around sustainability. And I think that's made a very, very important difference to us. Now, Vice Chancellor Malone this morning mentioned many of the areas that the congressman has supported over the years. And as Mike was going through his list, I realized I was going to be able to touch on almost all of the areas under the umbrella of sustainability. The only one I couldn't figure out how to work in was the large millimeter telescope. I just couldn't figure out the sustainability slant on that one. I want to go back a little way, so I want to start with um, the congressman's support for seafood safety. And you might ask, well, how is that related to sustainability? Well, it turns out at the time the congressman first started supporting the UMass work on seafood safety, there was a lot of interest in um, food safety and the development of the HACCP standards, but there wasn't much attention being paid to seafood. And the congressman realized this void, realized the expertise that the campus had, and realized that it was important to sustaining the fisheries industry to support that. The interesting thing out of that, of course, it allowed us to maintain the station in Gloucester for many years, which has now evolved into the Lodge Pelagics Research Center, which is still doing research on sustainable fisheries, helping to support the fisheries industry here in Massachusetts. The other thing that came out of the seafood safety work was the um, health and wellness center. So this whole notion that food had a significant impact on our health and wellness. The whole notion around buy local and having healthy ingredients in our foods and healthy ways of preparing them. And the congressman's support eventually led to the, to the creation of the health and wellness center, which is over here in Chenoweth Hall. Of course, he was also a very early supporter of climate change research. He realized early on how important an issue this was going to be, and he was an early supporter. He realized the quality of the people that we had here at UMass, such as Ray Bradley, and the impact that they were having on study of climate change, but not just studying the reasons behind climate change, but also the implications. What are the ramifications? What kind of adjustments are we going to have to make over time? And that research now, of course, has led to the development of the Climate System Research Center here on the campus, supported by the Department of Interior, to look regionally at the impacts of climate change. John Clora this morning was mentioned in the Transportation Center and the um, Congressman's support for transportation. And it's really his interest in transportation has dovetailed very nicely with his interest in sustainability and the environment in many ways. Now, when they built the new center, of course, they used some green building technologies. They have very high efficiency boilers in there and lights with occupancy centers and stuff. But I think even more importantly than that is the activity that's going on in there. As John mentioned, there's the um, uh, Regional Travelers um, Information Center, which helps people make good decisions about how to engage in sustainable transportation and travel in the region. And I think that's been especially important. Of course, it's also been an advocate of alternative fuels, and we've been done some incredible research here on the campus on alternative fuels. Um, Mike mentioned the Geobacter work that Derek Lovely is doing, and to me, this is one of the things that really gives you a sense of John's character. John used to call Derek up every once in a while when he had a question about energy, and he'd say, hey, Derek, what do you think? And I like that about having a congressman who's willing to go out there and ask the important questions like that. Another area where was, uh, transportation and sustainability have really come together in a significant way was looking at connectivity of ecosystems. That is, aquatic and um, terrestrial ecosystems, how do they connect? How do they get broken up? 
Very often it's by things like highways, culverts, those kind of things. And so he supported the conservation assessment and protection system, which has basically modeled that kind of connectivity, allowed us to ask the questions about how do we make decisions about our transportation system and other infrastructure in a way that's going to be most sustainable. Had a very significant impact on the quality of drinking water as well. So those are all, I think, just great examples. Now, at the university here, we've kind of tried to brand our sustainability program. And I saw a little buzz slogan is, learn it, live it, and lead it. And you can see from the research that's going on, we're trying to learn new approaches to sustainability. And as you'll see in a minute, we're trying to spend some time passing it along to students as well. But we're also paying attention to what we're actually doing on the campus in order to um, have a more sustainable campus so that our faculty and our students and our staff whoop, are all um, experiencing sustainability firsthand. And I, I'll be honest with you, I think we have an incredible record here at UMass in terms of sustainability. We've actually hired a sustainability coordinator. He's sitting there in the back of the room. Ezra, give him a little wave. There you go. Here's what the campus has done under um, our sustainability efforts. So the campus has reduced its carbon footprint by 30%. A 30% reduction in the carbon footprint for the campus. We've reduced steam use by 24%. Some of you that know the campus know that you used to walk around in the winter time, you'd see steam coming out of the ground, there'd be a clearing in the snow and there'd be green grass growing. Well, we've worked very hard to increase the efficiency of steam delivery here on the campus. We've also reduced electric use 9%. And you might say, 9%? That's not very much. The problem is, every time we do things to reduce electric use, we get another group of students show up with more of these electronic devices picking up electri electric use. So it's a very challenging um, piece. Our fleet now uses 20% biodiesel. We have a 56% recycling rate in the um, in the uh, dormitories, and we buy close to 30% local goods. So I think we have a pretty impressive record. One of the things I want to point to is, in fact, the central heating plant. It's the single largest contributor to that 30% reduction in CO2 emissions. It is a cogeneration plant, which means that we um, burn fuel, we use it to um, generate steam, which we use to generate electricity, but we also use that steam for heating as well, cogeneration, a very efficient process. In fact, we have the best cogeneration plant in the country. Now, I don't mean just the best cogeneration plant on any campus in the country, I mean the best cogeneration plant anywhere in the country, a very, very efficient system. I also want to point out, though, that these sustainability efforts have been um, led in very large measure by students. Many of you heard about the Permaculture Garden, which was a completely student-initiated. They were in a competition um, sponsored by the White House. They won that competition, and last summer they got to go down and visit with the president. Um, sustainability is becoming increasingly more important to students as they see it as part of their future. And we've spent a lot of time um, creating um, new programs. Um, Charlie mentioned that Masters in Sustainability, we also have programs in green building technology as well on the campus. So it's um, a very exciting time. Now, a couple of times the Integrated Science Building has come up. It's one that had some federal support in it and we were very appreciative of the congressman. Now this is one that the congressman understood really well too because what we do in that building is we basically teach chemistry and biology. And when you're teaching chemistry and biology, you tend to use a lot of chemicals that aren't necessarily good to breathe in. So you have a lot of fume hoods in that building. So there's a lot of air being sucked out of that building. In fact, and I didn't believe this when I first heard it, but the architects tell me it's true, the, the residence time of an air molecule in the integrated science building is four minutes. That means every four minutes, that new molecule, that molecule's going out and new molecules are being pumped into the building. 
And so um, it's a huge challenge to have an energy efficient building in which you're going to teach the sciences. One of the, the technologies that was developed in that building is something called an entropy wheel. It's actually a device that allows you to exchange not just temperature, but moisture. Because when you have to either heat or cool, cool air in order to condition it, you also have to control the moisture content. If you bring in cold air and you heat it up, it's going to be very dry. If you bring in um, warm air and you cool it down, it's going to be very moist. The entropy wheel actually works to exchange both heat and moisture without exchanging any of the gases, because all those gases you're pulling out are the ones that contain the chemicals that you don't necessarily want the students to be breathing. So um, very exciting technology built into that particular building. The other thing that's been mentioned a couple of times, but I think it's just such a great example of regional cooperation, is the um, Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. This is a fantastic collaboration among several universities, BU, um, Harvard, MIT, um, University of Massachusetts, as well as companies like EMC and Cisco, to take advantage of the green power that's um, available in Holyoke, low cost, environmentally benignly produced, and put it to use for something that's a very high um, energy use thing, such as supercomputing, high performance computing. So this has been a great opportunity for the region. In fact, that's one of the things I'd like to point to with, with the congressman, is one of the things that he's been most successful in is to help UMass see itself as part of a region. That we're part of this region, and everything we do to cooperate in, um, within the region is really in not only our best interest, but in the best interest of Western Massachusetts and the Commonwealth as well. So, I am um, not too long ago, maybe two or three months, uh, Congressman McGovern was visiting the campus along with Congressman Oliver, and they were telling stories about the, this, the fact that we're really starting to develop sort of an anti-science attitude within Congress. And quite frankly, some of the stories they were telling were a little bit scary. And it made me realize how lucky we were to have a scientist slash politician representing us in Congress for all of these years. Finally, Charlie said we should say something about the future. Now, I think it was uh, this, the quote, um, uh, predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about the future. I think it usually gets attributed to the physicist Neil Bohr. I'm, gonna, um, I'm sure he stole it from somebody else. It's too good a quote. But I'm going to stay away from predictions. I'm going to talk about two of my hopes and my dreams. One of my hopes has to do with east-west rapid transit from Springfield to Boston. I think of all the things that we could do for this region to improve economic development, to improve the position of the university, and to improve the quality of life in Western Massachusetts, that east-west rapid transit is really one of the top ones. And so my dream is that someday we'll get there. I think it's been an important priority for the congressman for many years. I hope that as he um, goes into retirement, he'll still have some energy and continue to work with us on this really important issue. The other dream I have it really has to do with the integration across the environmental um, areas, because it's such clearly an area that requires multiple disciplines, multiple groups coming together, thinking about how we deal with these problems. And so one of the things I'd really love to see on the campus is us to find a way to physically bring these different disciplines, such as ge geosciences and environmental conservation and the Center for Public Policy and Analysis, to bring them all together in a, f in a single physical location. So that's another one of my dreams. I would say that um, I think that sustainability and the environment is going to be one of the long-lasting legacies of Congressman Oliver. So thank you very much. Thanks to Steve. Um, 
in, in going to the next speaker, I have two different directions I could go. One is because I'm in the Natural Sciences College, but I also teach in the Center for Public Policy Administration where we have nonprofit people working. There's one linkage between the two speakers that's starting to connect those two units. And, and, and then the second is we're scaling now from local um, UMass and what's going on here to now what I would say is a regional um, speaker talking about um, land conservation in the Pioneer Valley. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Kristen DeBoer to come up and let me just give a little bit of background. She's the executive director of Kestrel Land Trust, a regional land trust in the Pioneer Valley dedicated to the protection of forests, fields, farms, and wetlands. And in her position, um, she works with landowners, town conservation commissions, state agencies, other, other land trusts to conserve thousands of acres of open land and critical habitat in our region. Specifically, she's worked with the congressman on a range of projects, including the recent acquisition of 32 acres of grassland bird habitat in Hadley. And prior to joining Kestrel, she worked as an environmental educator and advocate with several other nonprofits. And she's graduated with, from Bucknell University with a bachelor's degree in resource economics and environmental studies from Antioch, and then from Antioch New Graduate School with a master's in environmental studies. So with that, um, Welcome our next speaker. Hello, and thank you for having me. Hello, Congressman Oliver. It's, um, it's an honor to be here today to, to speak to Congressman Oliver's achievements in, in land conservation uh, because he's one of the few people in Congress, I believe, who really walks his talk. Uh, this is a, a congressman who you could easily find um, scaling a cliff face in his youth, perhaps, or hiking on, on the trails, um, paddling a river. And you know, in the conservation community, having someone who, who you'd feel comfortable with going backpacking is a, is a big uh, achievement in itself, because it builds that kind of credibility that he re really believes in what he is doing and has that soulful connection to the land uh, and a vision that inspires much more practical work to secure funding for land conservation in Congress. Um, and, you know, I, I'll say that uh, we've had a Kestrel Land Trust. We're a regional land trust that is uh, serving 19 towns in the valley. We're founded in Amherst, where Congressman Olver is from. Um, so certainly the uh, the connection to a very specific sense of place, I think, informs the congressman's sensibilities as well as our land trust sensibilities. It's that uh, sense of farms and fields and mountains and the river that runs through our region that, that connects us, all of our communities, that I think um, inspires certainly our work and inspires the congressman, the congressman's work. And, you know, over the years, we've had opportunities to meet with um, John Olver over maps, which is one of his favorite things to do. I didn't bring them today because I thought we might get stuck looking at one too long. Um, but I, I do want to say just a few, highlight a few of the special places that the congressman has helped us secure over the last 10 years, and some of them have been mentioned already. But if you, if you would, for the sake of uh, keeping you all awake, is uh, just create a mental map for yourselves. I think most of you are from the region. I recognize a lot of familiar faces. Um, but if you start in the, in the farmlands of the valley, you know, we have the richest farmland in the world here, right in the Connecticut River Valley. And as it connects to sustainability, farmland is the stage for local food security. It's the stage for everything else that is done to promote um, household security, making sure everyone has enough to eat. We need to start at the land. And, I, and I, uh, my own opinion about sustainability is that while it encompasses so much, um, sometimes we forget about the foundation, the land. And I think the congressman never forgets that. Um, and that's one of his, his great assets for us in Congress. Um, but starting with the farmland, uh, one, of, one of the pet projects or, or important projects that have been accomplished is the Connecticut River Farm Scenic Byway. Uh, and the scenic byways in Franklin County. And those are three roads, Route 47, Route 63, Route 2, uh, that both, both Kestrel Land Trust, Franklin Land Trust, and the Trustees of Reservations have all been involved with 
uh, conserving, also in partnership with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And uh, that, that was an exercise in finding wh what about the, the scenic landscape resonates with us? Why do farms inspire us so much? And um, literally the, the, the prioritization of some of those farmlands had to do with the, the scenic qualities of, of those places as well as the prime soils. And there's so much overlap there. Um, so together there's been uh, over $5 million spent on C Connecticut River Farm scenic byways that Congressman Elber has helped con conserve. Along with that, the Federal Ranch Protection Program has been a mainstay of the statewide agricultural preservation restriction program. And to me, it's, a, it's, um, it's been a tremendous blessing to realize that this region has uh, not only the local sources of funding that we rely on, the Community Preservation Act in each of our towns that we serve, as well as the state's agricultural preservation restriction program, but that's fueled uh, more than 50% by this FRPP program that uh, is tied into the uh, authorization of the Farm Bill, which Congressman has supported. Um, so if you move from the farmland of, of those scenic farms that, that we all drive by on our commutes to work and, and perhaps stop on the way home to grab a uh, salad for dinner, um, move into the forests. And a forests, again, are the stage for sustainability in that they're providing the clean water and the clean air that we rely on every single day. Couldn't, couldn't go more than a couple days without clean water. Um, and that the forests here are what supply that. Um, the federal program that has been the catalyst for so much forest conservation in the Connecticut River Valley and in the North Quabbin region in District 1 has been the Forest Legacy Program. And that is uh, derived from the U.S. Forest Service uh, notion that working landscapes, working forests are just as important as working farms. And last year we were able to uh, conserve the largest contiguous block of protected uh, private land in Massachusetts on Brushy Mountain. It's now known as the Paul C. Jones Working Forest. It's a conservation restriction that was purchased by the Department of Fish and Game with the assistance of Kestrel and Franklin Land Trust. Um, and this uh, $5 million from the Forest Legacy Fund. And that program um, has been replicated for so many landowners around the state. And uh, one of the, you know, the realizations for both farmland and forest land is that so, it, so much of it is still in private hands and should remain in private hands, but can be conserved in perpetuity by purchasing the development rights and allowing the farmers and the foresters to sustainably uh, continue producing and using that property. Um, so that, I think, has, has also been an asset. Um, and so as you drive, actually, uh, the, one of the best views of Brushy Mountain here in the valley is right from, from UMass. So take a look and, and know that that mountain was protected in part because of Congressman's work. Um, let's go to the rivers now. Uh, the, the Conti Refuge, which has been mentioned many times, is uh, the Silvio Oconte uh, National Fish and Wildlife Refuge that runs from the border of Canada starting with the three Connecticut lakes up in New Hampshire, all the way down to the Connecticut River Sound. And right here in the valley in Hadley, we have the, what's known as the Fort River Division. Fort River is one of the longest free-flowing rivers in Massachusetts. It's the home of an endangered species, the dwarf wedge muzzle. And the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with its partners, Kestrel Land Trust and Trust for Public Land, have been conserving land for the purposes of grassland bird habitat restoration and water quality and river restoration along the Fort River. Um, one of my favorite stories about Congressman Olver is uh, one morning he called me up after he had just been birding on Moody Bridge Road in Hadley uh, in, in the spring and he said, have you seen the bobolinks out there? You have got to protect this land and indeed we have. Um, and, and here's a case where uh, the, the focus of land conservation moves from the working landscape to biodiversity and habitat and the notion that sustainability is not just for human beings but for the non-human uh, living beings of this world, the critters that rely on the large open forests uh, for, for uh, habitat like black bear, ca uh, moose, Canada lynx, uh, bobcat, these are species that are, are typically north wood species and it's really I think a testimony to the um, resiliency and the, 
the habitat restoration that is happening in Massachusetts, the fact that we now have moose signs uh, you know, across Amherst Road and Pelham is, is a sign that, that our habitat is, is vast enough for some of these wide-ranging species, and then also to focus on the smaller places like grassland birds that need our restoration in order to have their habitat to continue. Um, so moving from the farms and the forests and the rivers uh, to the trails, I think the other component of sustainability is providing direct access for recreation. Uh, America's Great Outdoors Initiative through the Obama administration has put forth a vision of having uh, every child in America have the ability to access a trail within walking distance of their home. And it's, it's such a blessing to be here in the Connecticut River Valley where that is often the case. And one of the prominent trails that runs through our valley is the Metacomet Monadnock Trail. I actually had the uh, fortunate chance to be on that trail in, in New Hampshire for about six hours on Saturday and was reflecting on, on John Oliver's commitment to, to that particular space. And I think that reflects um, the, not only the vision of our country's national park system, um, but also just a real sense of justice and fairness that everyone have that ability to just walk the land and have that direct experience. So the New England National Scenic Trail um, is also you know, a trail that goes over much uh, of private land in the area. And so recognizing that balance and that tension between uh, public land and public ownership and private property rights is also one that the congressman was able to navigate through uh, Congress and through this special legislation that now um, gives us many opportunities in this region. Um, I, I said a, a, a bit before about my, my thoughts about sustainability being um, the foundation, the foundation of sustainability being the land, and I think that is more true now than ever. Uh, when we look at some of the future challenges that face us, certainly climate change is is on the horizon. It's happening. Uh, when you look, as many of us did, on the news and, and see these images of of flooding in the New York sub subways and people who are living in apartment buildings who don't have electricity. These are infrastructure failures due to climate change impacts. And uh, I, you know, I just met with a woman recently who's been a longtime supporter of Kestrel Land Trust from a distance in New Mexico, and she has land here in Leverett. And uh, she told me that she's just moved from New Mexico to the Northeast, in part because of the sense of extreme drought coming to the, to the uh, desert southwest. I, I watched the Dust Bowl last night, uh, Ken Burns' film, and, and these are um, you know, real hardships on the horizon due to climate change and climate change disruption, and yet the Northeast has this promise of being a resilient place, and if we continue the focus on land conservation as the foundation of sustainability, we have the chance to still have habitat uh, adaptation for wildlife. We have a chance to really sustain our water systems, to protect the farmland that will grow the food to feed us. And so I think as we move forward, it's important to uh, look, at, look at not only the crisis ahead, but the opportunities that we have right here in this sense of place, in this valley, and, and what we can do to preserve that stage for sustainability. Um, also looking you know, sort of from a practical standpoint, I think this, the uh, congressman's ability to marry vision with practicality uh, is also what land trusts excel at uh, because so many of our uh, environmental laws in this country rely on regulation. And I, I uh, used to do that for a living, uh, working on the Endangered Species Act. and and defending public lands from unsustainable resource extraction. And those are so important, they have to continue. But there's also uh, the notion of just buying it. And that is uh, to use the, the power of money to continue to provide incentives to private landowners to not develop their land and instead keep it in farming, you know, to not develop their land, but instead keep it in forestry. Um, and so these are incentives that I think have, have worked so well in the past and can continue to be 
the, a mainstay of the American conservation movement. And the, the one source of federal funding that I, that I will say that the Congressman has championed and that we need to continue to focus on is the Land and Water Conservation Fund, because that is the, uh, the wellspring from where all, all of these funding sources have come from, whether it's the U.S. Forest Service, the USDA, uh, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it all comes from the Land and Water Conservation Fund for the most part. And uh, that is a source of funding that is not from taxpayer dollars. It is from uh, oil and gas receipts, and it generates at least $6 billion a year, and almost $900 million of that uh, has been earmarked for land conservation in theory. Uh, but only one time in its 50-year history has that full amount been actually allocated toward land conservation. So the notion of fully funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund is a very practical step that does not impact uh, anybody's bottom line in terms of their household income and, and frankly has the ability to balance out sort of the, the, the national stage between energy use through oil and land conservation and, and using one to uh, ensure that the stage of, of our forests, our farms, and our rivers remains one that's resilient and that we can live from um, in a very sustainable and and joyous way, which we all know here in, 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 the, in the Valley. So thank you, Congressman Olver, for all your leadership on these issues, and I look forward to your questions. So, so this may be an obvious statement, but an underlying theme here, the way I think about it is environmental conservation and sustainability requires collaborative governance and management, and so uh, efforts between Congress, between nonprofits, between uh, federal agencies are, are all part of this. Um, and, and now we're scaling up from the region to now a broader region, which is the uh, uh, New England States region. So let me invite up Ira Leighton, who is the Deputy Regional Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency in New England uh, since 2000. He has over 30 years of experience in the environmental field and has served in numerous technical and management positions of the EPA, starting his career, and, and prior to that, he started his career in the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Prior to this current position, uh, Mr. Leighton directed EPA's New England Office of Environmental Stewardship, which houses re the region's enforcement, compliance assistance, and pollution prevention programs, and has man managed several key positions in the Office of Site Remediation and Restoration. He's recognized across the agency as a leading advocate in the areas of science, policy, environmental justice, and innovation. And he's a UMass alum, alum so welcome back to UMass, um, with a MS from Northeastern University in Environmental Engineering. So, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is uh, something I really look forward to when I found out that uh, Kurt Spaulding, my boss, He's the regional administrator, had a last-minute conflict. I, I jumped at the opportunity to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, what my comments are going to reflect on is, uh, at least speaking for myself and I think many at EPA, uh, being inspired is a really important part of why many of us ended up working in environmental careers. Uh, if you take a look at the profile of engineers and scientists and lawyers, that a part of EPA New England, we've all been looking for uh, the inspiration to make a difference in the quality of people's lives. That's literally why we all signed up. There are many leaders that we look to for inspiration, but for me, uh, Congressman Olver has always been one of those sources. Uh, in order to s uh, inspire folks, I think you have to have a number of attributes that the Congressman clearly demonstrates, in my opinion. Uh, first and foremost, you've got to be able to convince folks that there's a direct relationship between your words, your deeds, and your actions. If you do not find that, ultimately I don't think you're a source of inspiration. Another thing is to really emphasize that the environment, like so many other areas, is all about future generations. And if you look at con what Congressman Over has stood for, it is just a constant stream of a focus of, on future generations, training and developing the next generation of leaders. The uh, third and last component is the ability to have a holistic 
understanding of how the environment uh, connects with so many other things, the economy, social interests. Sustainability is all about being able to deal with the complexity of the relationship between social, economic, and environmental interests. So what I'm going to highlight is a number of major projects that the congressman championed and advanced. And in my opinion, when you look at all of these components, they truly are a source of inspiration. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is the work the congressman uh, did to ultimately develop the first zero net energy transit building in Greenfield, Mass. I had occasion to look at the video that was uh, on your website, Congressman, and I was just inspired by, by seeing the whole event. Uh, what that represents is the first ev ever effort to build a transit building that ultimately is zero net energy. It has built into it just amazing features, solar arrays, geothermal, uh, natural lighting. It's an amazing, amazing uh, building when you look at it. Uh, it had the benefit of uh, obviously uh, giving paychecks to a lot of people in Fr uh, Franklin County who had to build it, but most importantly, it leverages the relationship between transit and energy and the quality of life. So being the first zero net energy building is extraordinary. Uh, it's ideas like that that bring EPA New England to be working very closely with the state of Massachusetts in advancing zero net energy for all of our water and wastewater infrastructure. We have a vision of the future which calls for the thought of actually being able to design and operate water and wastewater treatment plants without importing a single kilowatt hour off the grid. And we actually have plants that are achieving that vision. But it's uh, projects like the one in Greenfield that is creating the feedstock of uh, ingenious and uh, cutting edge engineering technology that's going to get us to the broader vision. Uh, the next example of the congressman's work uh, is in the Greenfield Community College where ultimately he has uh, championed the installation of an alternative energy system. Here is the relationship between green jobs and community colleges promoting projects that place sustainable systems at work in the community college uh, universe and it ensures that what we're teaching in the classroom is ultimately going to be able to advance our future. If you take a look at that example, you'll find that uh, this, this relationship between presenting the youth of this country with the opportunity to know that if they work hard enough and they pursue the right academic background, they ultimately can make a profound difference in the quality of people's lives. Uh, one of the things that I try to, try to do frequently is to go to the graduation ceremonies of different uh, community colleges or at EPA, we have a Brownfields jobs training program where ultimately we're taking kids who don't have a future, many of them in urban areas, and we're equip equipping them with tools and capabilities that not only give them a future, but it gives their community a future. Uh, Congressman Olver's investment in community colleges is creating a generation of folks that are going to stay in the community and think more broadly about the future. Uh, another example of the Congressman's investments that are relevant to this is the investment in the two wind turbines at Wachusett Community College. As a result of those two turbines, 97% of the energy requirements are being met by those turbines. Uh, that's one small piece of a bigger picture, which is the curriculum that now exists at Mount Wachusett. A kid can go to Mount Wachusett and take one of the best programs imaginable in how you develop and design renewable energy projects really uniquely talented folks that are going to find a place in the economy and make a difference in the quality of people's lives. Uh, in that instance, we have kids that can take curriculums dealing with biomass, solar, thermal, geothermal applications, obviously, as well as uh, wind energy. Uh, an incredibly uh, wonderful story that's creating a future for all of us. In addition, uh, another project that he was uh, so instrumental in was the Holyoke Multimodal Transportation Center. This was built on a former brownfield site, and ultimately this investment is demonstrating the importance of different federal partners working together. 
It's ideas like this, the idea of the connection between brownfields and the use of a brownfield site for a transportation center that can be the source of inspiration for how we hope to look at the knowledge corridor. Uh, as you all probably know, the Springfield Holyoke Corridor just presents enormous opportunities where federal partners can come together and see these relationships to think holistically the way the congressman has. Uh, I want to offer one example of a product of that kind of thinking that we hope we can repeat in the uh, Springfield Corridor. Uh, we had uh, a project called the Fairmont Corridor. This is in Boston. And what we were observing in that instance was we had a number of brownfield sites in a transit corridor where the transit stops had skipped over various neighborhoods. Uh, many of these neighborhoods were environmental justice locations. Thanks to the kind of holistic thinking that Congressman Olver has really embedded in all of his uh, projects and ideas, we were able to come together with HUD, uh, the Federal Transit Authority, and EPA, and we were able to bring all of those forces together to redevelop the brownfield sites into new jobs, industry and new jobs, ultimately had HUD invest in the housing in that corridor to deal with things like lead poisoning and asthma. And in addition to that, ultimately brought all of these pieces together in a, in a way where families in this corridor will be able to find a job, be able to take mass transit to work, and have safe and affordable housing. It's that kind of holistic vision that uh, Congressman Oliver has always stood for and the projects that he's advanced speak to that. Uh, one other comment I'd like to make is uh, I happen to get a chance to reread his article on climate change. It's somewhat prophetic that the congressman uh, published that article about sounding the alarm on climate change literally happening one month before Hurricane Sandy. And uh, as Chris noted, this whole notion of resilience our ability to create an environment that has the ability to adapt and respond to the challenges of climate change is extraordinarily important. And as I read the congressman's comments on that, I was really proud of the fact that I'm part of EPA New England. Uh, the New England states have been national leaders with the REGI region. Uh, hopefully that means something to all of you, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative literally a, a carbon cap and trade program trying to find its roots right here in New England. Uh, the reason that that kind of thinking can happen is that we have a congressional delegation led by people like Congressman Over that give us the po political momentum to be able to do those kinds of things, to show the rest of the country that the efforts to deal with climate mitigation and adaptation are absolutely right on target. So uh, these are just a few examples. Uh, for me, as an engineer and a scientist uh, and a UMass alum, one of the things that is a really important part of my life that uh, the congressman has definitely influenced. When I was a, a student here a million years ago, it seems, I uh, was literally living in the John F. Kennedy era, and I know the inspiration that that provided me, that I, I made a commitment that I wanted somehow, some way to make a difference in the quality of people's lives. I wanted a job in the public world. Uh, Congressman uh, Overs, uh, many years of service to me is a real source of inspiration. You make a big difference if you invest your talent and energy in the public arena, and I think he exemplifies that. So Congressman, thank you so much for being a source of inspiration, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this program.